Well, good morning and welcome to Rancho. We are so glad that you're here with us today. We like to spend just a couple of minutes at the very beginning giving you an idea of what to expect in the service. And so today we are beginning week two of a brand new series called Brand new. Yeah. So, uh, hey, it's our post Easter series. It's all about sort of, you know, re emerging, restarts, renewals, second chances, third chances. And you got to start it last week. Exceptional message. So, if you didn't check that out, check it out. And uh, yeah, so today we're going to talk about a brand new invitation to a new start after failure. So, if any of you have, have, have had any failures or mistakes or regrets, maybe one or two of you, or it's going to be a good time today. Yeah. yeah? No, right. I got to hear and really good, really relevant. Um, Several things I appreciated. And then today in Wagar, I am joined uh, by my friend Dylan, a middle school volunteer. You're going to get to know him and hear a little bit more of his story later in the service. And we're kicking everything off with a song that we wanted to introduce for Easter. Um, we did introduce for Easter. It's right. called Might Get Loud, and it's a ton of fun. It's a ton of fun. I, I, when you do this song, it just burrows in my brain, yes. and it just sticks there for at least a week. So yeah, it stays thank there. you in advance for, you know, getting uh, in my For the head. earworm for the yeah. rest of the week. Yeah, <laughs> exactly yeah, right. I totally it's get great. it. It's great. Let's yeah. all stand and, and get to started. Let's do it.
on, let's sing about his goodness. All the faithfulness that we've seen him do, all the things that we read about, that we hear about, all of these stories combined in this one thing that he is faithful. Say, there is no fear, cause I believe. There is no doubt, cause I have seen your faithfulness, my fortress over and over. I have a hope found in your name. I have a faith found in your grief. Let's pray together. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you that we can look back at these things and see your faithfulness. We thank you that when we're facing something, that we're coming up towards something or we're going through something in the moment, that we can look back and see that you are faithful and you will be faithful again and you will be faithful again and again and again and your faithfulness will never run out you've proven yourself over and over again so we have rest in this knowing that you love us that you are faithful that you never leave us never forsake us and what wonderful news to know that in our failures in our doubt, in our sin, in everything that we go through, that you love us, that you say, I choose you over and over again. You are the one that I love. God, so we thank you for that. We give you honor and glory this morning, and we sing this song to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, sing this out.
difícil. Welcome to Rancho. We are so glad that we get to be with you today. My name is Carissa. I'm joined by my friend Dylan this morning. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Glad you're here. And if you are brand new with us today, whether you're in person or you're joining us online, or maybe you're newer to Rancho, you've been kind of checking things out for a little while. We would love to connect with you. We want you to know, we want to know that you're out there. And the best way to begin that conversation is just to text the word new to the number 951 379-3795. When you text us, we're going to text you back. We're just going to begin a conversation, answering any questions you may have. Um, and then when you take that text out to our welcome center today, we have friendly faces out there that would love to send you home with a gift. Right, Dylan? Yes. Gift. And then we've got some information we want to put in your hands. Just lots of cool stuff that you maybe are already asking about. Um, and so that's available for you today. And then what about all the questions, needs, prayer requests? Anytime you have a question, you can always email us at info at rancho.tv. Yeah, absolutely. Save that so you have easy access to it. And then we want to say a big thank you to our generosity partners today. Our generosity partners are those individuals that partner with us giving financially. That might be a one-time gift. That might be a monthly recurring gift. Uh, we cannot do what we do here in our church and our community around the world without you. And I got to have a really cool conversation about a month ago with one of our global ministry partners. Um, their executive director and I jumped on Zoom and I got to hear about my Refuge House, which is a home for young girls in the Philippines who have been rescued from trafficking. And the work that they are doing is just incredible. And we have had the privilege of partnering with them monthly since 2017. So they are giving these girls access to safety, to therapeutic resources, counseling resources, um, getting them caught up at school. Oftentimes they're several years behind. Um, even helping them transition into college life, which is just so cool. And then a new thing I learned that they just started is now they are partnering with siblings and the parents, because there's finding that these girls who are at risk, uh, their families are also at risk as well. So if you would like to find out more information about becoming a generosity partner, you can always head to rancho.tv slash giving. All the information can be found there. Now, Dylan, yes. you are a rock star volunteer in our <laughs> middle school ministry, right? I try to be. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I stole you because normally you're over there Yes. In the gym during the 1045 service. Um, now, true story, and I had to get permission from my sixth grade son, Landon, to share the story. Um, he loves middle school ministry. Yes, he does. Loves it. Now, he also loves baseball, and baseball has pulled him away more often than he would like lately from middle school. And he was telling us that at dinner a few weeks ago. He was like, oh, man, like I have another game on a Wednesday night, and I have to miss. And he was bummed. I'm bummed too. I miss yeah. it. And so I just said, hey, you know, Landon, what is it about middle school ministry that you enjoy so much? And he thought for a second and he goes, Dylan, Charlie, and Carter. Like three of our incredible middle school volunteers, he just names them. Like you guys are a big part of the reason why he enjoys being in community here as a sixth grade boy. And so thank you for the work that you're doing. I'm glad to do it. I love doing it. It's so cool. It's so cool. How long have you been serving in middle school ministry? <sighs> Four, five years? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me one thing you love about it. The thing I love the most is definitely in the summer when we go to our escape camp. That's the highlight of my summer. But overall, just love working with all volunteers. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, just like Landon Carter, Charlie the Great, Bob, Alyssa, yeah. Tiffany, all of them. They're all so much fun. And getting to play games with the kids doing the messages, the small groups, just having that community, it's so nice. That's awesome. Now, here at Rancho, our volunteers truly are the heartbeat of all of our ministries, whether it's middle school, high school, kids, ushers, greeters, behind the scenes production. Um, we are so grateful for the people that we get to partner with, just like you. And so, um, did you know it was supposed to rain today? I heard that, but 
It hasn't rained. I don't know what happened. So we canceled all the things for Sunday fun day on Tuesday because it was like supposed to rain all weekend long. We only got rain yesterday. But I think it's good because next Sunday, it's going to be sunshine and 78 degrees. And we have three inflatables and cornhole and volleyball and hot dogs and all the fun things, including a fun new surprise we're going to tell everybody about in just a moment. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we're going to wrap this up and then we're going to invite Scott up. So, okay. and, and that's, that's what's, what's going, going on, on at Rancho. Rancho. All right. Let's invite Scott up. So, we have this. I'm going this out a little bit. Because we have uh, standards. It has to be perfectly straight. Sorry. Perfectly sorry, sorry. straight. It's all good. You were on a time crunch. Uh, we're doing a cornhole tournament next weekend, next Sunday, right after the last service. All the funds raised go towards middle school summer camp. Right. It's going to be epic. And we had a crazy idea this week that you can buy the opportunity to be on Scott's team. Oh, wow. Or my team. <laughs> I'm sure I go cheap. Or Steve's team, or Ryan Beaver's team, or Tiffany's team, or Alex's team. Um, we just want this to be a fun opportunity to connect. And so if you're not already registered to be on a team, you could be on our team. All right. But we thought charitable, they might want to know like, gift, whose right? yeah. team they really okay. want to be so on. We're gonna... So we got to show them what's going on. All right. Now, Dylan is like a bonus. So if you like the way he throws, he's already got a, a he's partner. He's got good technique. But he said he could be bought out. Right. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. All right, so this is not the regulation 27 feet, so it's a little disappointing, I'll be honest with you. But uh, all right, let's see what we can do here. No pressure, no pressure, no, no pressure. pressure. <laughs> He made it first service, too. <laughs> he did, but he missed it in rehearsal. <laughs> Maybe that was intentional. That. I don't know. All right, Dylan, show us what you got. All right, all right. I love the technique. No. Oh. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Chris, let's right. see what you can do. I don't know what's happening. Okay. Okay. You're, 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 I actually I'm didn't know that. I'm left-handed, yes. All right. I know, we're special. No pressure. <laughs> yes, you are. Oh, wow. <laughs> Good job. That was very, very nice. All right, so whose team are you picking? Oh, uh, wow. That's going to be a, a tough mine. call. <laughs> well, Krista and Dylan, thank you. we got a, a great time scheduled next week, so look forward to having you back. Bring a friend. There's uh, food and cornhole and lots of stuff, inflatable stuff for the kids, all the basketball, volleyball, everything's going to be out there. We've got a new Gaga pit out there as well, so lots of fun next week. Let's give uh, Dylan and the rest of the middle school volunteers a round of applause. They do such good work for our kiddos. All right, well... You may not know this, but this is the real Holy Week. I don't know if you know a lot about church history and church or all that, but we had Easter two weeks ago. This is the real Holy Week because it is Master's Weekend. It is the Master's, and I will tell you, I just I, I absolutely God's honest truth, if I wasn't on staff, I'd be at home watching the Master's. <laughs> Yeah, I'm being honest, I'm being real. This is the one weekend I obsess on golf. I watch all four days of the tournament. The only tournament all week I watch all four days. So I don't wanna hear any updates. I don't wanna hear, did you hear anything? I just want, I'm gonna go home after this and I'm gonna get some Mexican food and plop in front of a couch and obsess on every shot of the Masters. Now, um, this is uh, bittersweet every year because probably 12 years ago, I got a call from a golfing buddy of mine and he says, now don't get too excited, but 95% sure we're going to the Masters. And I said, well, what do you mean we're going to the Masters? I said, well, did you get, get lottery to, to attend? No, he says, we are gonna play Augusta National two rounds. We're gonna play a round, stay a night, and play another round. Now, if you don't know golf, that probably wasn't impressive to say, but it is like sacred ground, sacred, nobody plays Augusta National. You could play St. Andrews, you could play Pebble Beach, you could play Sawgrass, you can play all the big tournaments and all the big courses, you cannot play this course. The most exclusive course probably on earth. And he says, 95%, we're getting in. We're taking a member's jet, we're gonna fly into Augusta and we're gonna play two rounds. He says, somebody backed out of a foursome, I get to invite one person and I pick you. But there's a chance this other person might get in. So two weeks before we were supposed to go, the other person slid back in and he called me for the worst call of my life. <laughs> and uh, says, I'm sorry, you're bumped. And then of course, when he was playing the two rounds, he just bombed my phone with about a thousand pictures. And I'm like, dude, you're no longer my friend. <laughs> End of discussion. You should have given up your seat and, and give me that spot. No, I wouldn't have done that. But uh, anyway, so it's Masters weekend. Uh, it's also a weekend I'm back. I, you know, got a chance to go to Texas uh, last weekend to... Mary, my sister-in-law, 
So she got uh, married to a wonderful man, and I'm the cheap uh, pastor, <laughs> so uh, they, they get a free pastor service from me, so I get to officiate the weddings and the funerals for the Allen family, but it is a great uh, pleasure, and so uh, she just walked up. I just gave away the bride, and shortly after, or no, her dad gave away the bride, and shortly after this, uh, my two-year-old nephew screams, there's a bug, I gotta get the bug, and he goes right to my feet to grab a bug, right? <laughs> And this is Texas, so everything in Texas is designed to kill you, right? The, the bugs, the snakes, it's gonna sting, it's gonna bite, it's out to get you. And of course, the, the bug was a one-inch black ant. Uh, so there's fire ants in Texas that are out to get you. These black ants are going to mess with you. So he goes up there to grab the ant, he has his fingers on the ant, and I'm using my feet to kind of kick away the two-year-old and then kick away the ant. All there are are pictures of me kicking a two-year-old right as soon as my... Uh, sister-in-law was, you know, <laughs> given away to be married, but it was a fun time. Um, months ago, uh, Jenny was booking the flights and discovered that the, week, the day after her wedding would be the, the eclipse. And this Texas city is right in the path of totality. So very smart, very kind, very wise wife I have. Um, she extended our trip for a day and we got to experience the, the totality. So that's kind of cool. And uh, so here we are checking it out glasses, um, and it was very fun. Now, inside the house, was the news was on, and the doors were open, so we get to hear the news and just track the timing, and from Mexico all the way up through North America, and so the announcer says, the first totality has happened. Well, someone who I won't mention, who you know might not hear real well, oh my gosh, there was a first fatality. And shouts this out, and we're like, what, a fatality about the eclipse? And so people go in and out wondering about the fatality. So from now on, the eclipse totality is known in our household as the fatality. And, uh, but it was a good time and really spectacular because it was supposed to rain. All Monday, it was supposed to rain in Texas. And um, right as soon as the moon started to shadow the sun, um, the skies parted. And it was really cool. We got to see the whole thing all the way through totality and beyond. So it was pretty, pretty fun. Now, of course, there are sort of the fringe religious elements who are talking about, you know, the end of the world and the apocalypse and end is near and repent and all that stuff because of the, the uh, eclipse there. But uh, what was kind of funny is during the eclipse, um, the skies turned black right afterwards. I mean, like Texas storm black. If you've not been in a Texas storm, when it hits, it hits hard. And the skies turn black, thunder in the distance, our phones start popping that there's a hailstorm warning, then our phones start popping that there's a tornado warning, and then of course, uh, 10 trillion cicada insects are about to come out of the ground in Texas and infest the entire place. So we knocked off about six of the 10 plagues as well. But uh, we all lived, we all had a good time, and I'm certainly happy to be back for this series called Brand New. And as I was thinking about the, the eclipse and thinking about this series, I thought, you know what? This is sort of the story of life. This is the rhythm of life. Life, light to dark to light. That is the rhythm of life. Things can be bright, things can be happy, times could be good. Inevitably, things get a little dark. For some people, things can get pretty black. Life can take a turn. Somebody could do something to us. Circumstances just happen, or maybe we make a mistake. Maybe we fail somehow, and that bright light turns dark. And the question is, is there light again? Is there light again? Or is it gonna stay like this? Is it gonna stay this heavy? Is it gonna stay this difficult? Is it gonna stay this dark? So this series is about hope. That no matter how dark the skies get, there's light emerging Believe it, receive it, accept it, and then let's do our part to see the light reemerge. Uh, last week, uh, Carissa led off the series in a wonderful way. This idea of a brand new heart and a brand, brand new mind. For so, so for those of us who might be you know, sort of trapped in, in difficult emotions, there is a way forward. It may not be super clean all the time or super easy all the time, but there is a way forward to a new heart and a new mind. And today we're gonna to talk about uh, emerging from failure. Emerging from failure. So this whole idea that light can turn dark, but even in the darkness, it can be light again. It follows a rhythm. And this rhythm is the rhythm of life. It is the rhythm of God's story in our life. And it's the rhythm actually of every story ever told. 
So if you're a student of literature or cinema or fiction, you may know that every single story ever told has five predictable plot lines. Every story, you can follow them. So from now on, every book you read, every movie you watch, you are gonna know these are the five plot lines that are predictable in every single story. It all starts with anticipation. There is some hope that something good is gonna happen. Every novel, every movie, there's some hope that something good is gonna happen. And then the character experiences a little bit of that hope. A little bit of that dream emerges and they experience some good things. And so there's this sort of hopeful light that emerges early in the story. Then things start taking a turn. There's frustration. The dream that you just started grasping starts to fall apart a little bit. And then there's the nightmare, this intractable problem that says it is all collapsing. The skies are absolutely black. There is no hope ahead. That's the nightmare scenario followed by the conclusion, which is some kind of a resolution to the story. Every story has the same five plot lines without fail including the greatest cinematic triumph ever produced, Nacho Libre. <laughs> this church is founded on the value systems of Nacho Libre and the, you know, the, the, the mission of Nacho Libre, and so we wanna go through this, right? The five predictable elements of this story begins with anticipation. What if this friar could become a luchador, a, a, a Mexican wrestler? starts secretly wrestling, right? The dream, a secret life as a luchador, and he starts to make a little bit of money. Then his friar cloak catches on fire, revealing the luchador costume underneath, and frustration begins. He's caught, he's outed, he wants to be a luchador, a great sin in the mind of the church. And then there's a nightmare, he's out in the wilderness, perhaps to die, there is no hope of him becoming a luchador or becoming a respected friar. And then of course, there's the resolution. He defeats the region's champion luchador, makes a lot of money, buys the orphan a bus and the orphan's good foods. And so that is uh, Nacho Libre. Every story ever told, ever told has those five elements including, in all seriousness, the story of Jesus, has those five elements. There's the anticipation. Jesus starts his ministry with his baptism and the words of God, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then he goes and he starts to experience the dream of preaching and teaching and performing miracles and crowds start to gather around Jesus. There's some good things happening. Thousands of people gather around Jesus. He becomes so popular that the religious leaders start to become threatened and they start putting poison pills and rumors and, 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 and they're slandering him and they're starting to, to conspire against him. So this season of frustration and his ministry begins to dwindle. Then there's the nightmare of his betrayal by a disciple, his arrest, his torture and his crucifixion and all is lost. And then there's Easter Sunday. And we celebrated two weeks ago, this resolution, defeating the sin of the world, defeating even death itself, rising from the grave and his cause continues to this day. It is the human story. It is the divine story from light to dark to light again. And we see this in the scripture. In Isaiah 43, this great triumphal promise. Behold, God says, I'm gonna do something new. Now it will spring up, will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So whenever we experience the darkness and we experience the failures, either what other people do to us or failures from within, failures that we choose to, to, to do, just bad missteps and mistakes, right? The faults and flaws that are in us just kind of spill out. And we wonder, is there hope ahead? Is there forgiveness ahead? Is there a new start ahead? Is there a second chance ahead? We look at the word of God and we look at the character of God and we say, yes, absolutely and always. There can be a brand new start from failure. A brand new start from failure. And then we can kind of look at the Bible through that lens. Does the Bible offer new starts from failure? Well, you read in your Bible, start in the Old Testament, you read the creation accounts, there's two of them, and you go, okay, that's really cool. Turn the page, and immediately there's failure, right? There's these five origin stories, some take them as literal, some take them as more figurative, but you got the story of Adam and Eve, and what do they do? Immediately, God says, don't touch that tree, and they touch that tree. It's just the way it goes, failure. And there's consequences to that failure, but that, then God gives them a second chance. And then they have children, Cain and Abel, and Cain murders his brother Abel. This is page three of the Bible, Cain murders his brother Abel. And there are significant and serious consequences. 
but God even gives him a second chance. Then the world, through the story of Noah and the ark, the world carries the consequence of its violent choices. The world chooses violence, particularly violence against women during the time of Noah, and God says, I've had it, and there are huge consequences, but then God gives a second chance. And then you turn the page and you see the story of the Tower of Babel, right? This is when the world says, we want power. We want the power of God himself, so they unify and build this tower, and there are consequences to that. But then God gives them a second chance. Then you turn the page of the Bible and you get to Abraham, and he's the father of, of Israel and the father of Judaism, and even in respects, the father of Christianity itself. Uh, Islam claims Abraham as a father as well. So here's this great father of the monotheistic religions. He fails miserably. God promises him a child, and Abraham says, well, I'll just have a child with my mistress. Not a good idea, right? He deals with the consequence of that, but then God gives him a second chance. Then you have Isaac. This is the child of promise. He has almost no interest in following God, basically abandons the faith, is a terrible, terrible father, and yet he's considered one of the patriarchs. And then he has a son, Jacob, Jacob fails by deceiving his brother and deceiving his father to steal a birthright. This is a family shame, a shame to the name, a shame to the tribes, a shame to the world. Yet God is known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Three people with almost nothing but documented failures in the Bible, right? They're the, they're the fathers, they're the patriarchs of this faith that we still practice today. And God says, I am proud to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, three people who have failed so much, but I've given them grace and I've given them a second chance. Then again, you turn the Bible. You have Moses. Here you have the people of Israel in captivity, in slavery to Egypt, and God calls out a deliverer, Moses. Well, he is not a perfect man. He murdered an Egyptian and ran away in the wilderness for decades, but God gives him a second chance. Even though there's consequences, he gives him a second chance. Then you have the nation of Israel freed from Egypt. By God's miraculous grace, they brought the superpower Egypt to their knees and then Egypt releases Israel by the hand of God immediately. They build a golden calf, worship this idol and there's incredible consequences. Yet God gives them a second chance. And then over the course of the Old Testament, page after page after page, the nation of Israel is failing. The kings of Israel are failing. At times, even the prophets of Israel are failing. The priests of Israel are failing. Time and time again, the Bible is so open and so honest and so real about human failures. And every time there's consequences, but every time there's grace, every time there's forgiveness, and every time there's a second chance, third chance, or fourth chance. So here's what we see out of the scripture. Old Testament and New Testament. So honest about the failures of men and women who are trying, but sometimes fail miserably. Deal with the consequences, but then God's grace just pours out. God gives second chances, third chances, fourth chances, fifth chances, and more with the invitation for brand new starts. Brand new starts are always available. Even at the very last page of the Bible, Revelation 21.5, behold, God says, I am making all things new. God says, I'm not gonna stop making things new. I'm not gonna stop giving my forgiveness. I'm not gonna stop giving grace. I'm not gonna stop giving second, third, fourth, fifth chances and more. I'm not gonna stop making all things new. It doesn't matter how much or how badly you fail. There will be grace. There will be forgiveness. There will be another chance. That is good, good news. Here's sort of the broader principle, right? God hates to see us hurt ourselves and others. Let's just kind of call that out. God is a heavenly father and any mother or any father looking upon their children would hate to see us hurt ourselves and hate to see us hurt others. Any parent whose child is hurting themselves, it grieves you. Any parent whose siblings are at each other's throats grieves a parent. And so let's just call it, God hates to see us hurt ourselves and others by the choices we make. It grieves him as a father. Yet, he loves to forgive and he loves to give us another chance. Again, like any perfect parent, you've hurt yourself, there's forgiveness and another chance. You've hurt each other, there's forgiveness and another chance. Now, there's some consequences along the way. There's consequences to our failures. 
But in the eyes of God, there's always forgiveness and always another chance. Let's take a look at Jeremiah 31. I love this passage. Now, Jeremiah 31 is written in the, in the face of the failures of the nation of Israel as documented in the Old Testament. They have failed so badly that the entire nation has been taken over by foreign countries. They have betrayed God. They've betrayed every good thing. They've become weak as a nation, vulnerable to attack, and the nations have attacked. And here's what God says in Jeremiah 31. I am as likely to reject my people Israel as I am to abolish the laws of nature. What's God saying? I will never abandon my people. I will never abandon my children. It doesn't matter what they do, doesn't matter how much they have failed, I'm never gonna abandon them. This is what the Lord says. Just as the heavens cannot be measured and the foundations of the earth cannot be explored, so I will not consider casting them away for the evil they have done, I the Lord have spoken. Now when the Bible says I the Lord have spoken, this is as serious as it gets because God says my word is always true, I am always faithful to my word, I never abandon my promise, and God says no matter how much my people have failed, and read the Old Testament, it's spectacular failures. No matter how much they have failed, I will never cast them out, I will never abandon them, no matter the evil they have done, and we could translate that to our own lives. No matter what we have done, no matter the mistakes we have made, no matter the failures that we have, you know, maybe, um, you know, enacted against God, against others to hurt the world around us, God says, I will never reject you. God says, I will never cast you away. I will always forgive you. And I will always give you the chance of a new start. That is the promise of God. I'll never reject you, never cast you away, always forgive you and always give you a new start. That's pretty comforting. So let me ask you, where have you failed? How might you have failed? I'd like you to stand up right now and, no. <laughs> but you know where you have failed and some of you are like, I have failed remarkably. I have destroyed my life. I've destroyed my family. I have hurt the people I love. I have missed opportunities. I have hurt other people intensely and you're living with that and you know right away where you have failed and you might live with the shame and the consequences of that, maybe even on a daily basis. For some of us, the failure may not be spectacular, but there are mistakes and missteps and regrets that you have and it may not weigh you down daily, but if you're like me, sometimes I think of something I said that was careless, something I did that might've been hurtful, uh, even something unintentional that I know caused another person pain, or I didn't do something that would have helped another person. I've got these little regrets that are spinning around in my head, and every once in a while they pop to the surface. And when those regrets pop to my attention, and it could be from decades ago, my whole chest just heats up, and I'm like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I wouldn't have said that, or I wish I would have done, done that better. These consequences can just be internal and in our, in our brains. I just wish I would have done better in that moment. So whether our failures are spectacular in public or whether they are more personal and private, we all live with the reality that we have failed or that we have regrets. What do you regret? Maybe you could have been a better spouse, a better parent. Maybe you could have treated your parents better, made better decisions, controlled your anger, used better words. What are your failures? What are your regrets? You know what that feels like. And I've got to say this, this might sound weird, but I think Jesus even knows what that feels like to fail. Now, we believe he's the son of God, the perfect son of God, the fullness of God. So did he actually fail in God's eyes? The answer is no, but by all measurements, his ministry failed, spectacularly failed. As we talked about earlier in sort of the narrative of the story of Christ, there's this anticipation that he's bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. He performs miracles and preaches powerfully and thousands of people are flocking to Jesus, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people. And then his teaching gets a little more difficult and his enemies start, you know, just poisoning his ministry and rumors and, and gossip and slander, right? And so people start falling away from Christ. In John chapter six, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. And there's a whole teaching on that that's very difficult. And, and just know that John six 
is very difficult teaching by Jesus around this concept that he's the bread of life. He's the one who is going to bring us the power and the life of God. And people start, well, what are you saying, Jesus? Are you saying you're the savior? Are you saying you are from God? And it starts to get real serious. And then people start falling away. In verse 66, from that time, many disciples went back and walked um, with him no more. They're done with Jesus. By the thousands, they're walking away from Jesus. And only the 12 remain, the OGs, only the 12 are there. And Jesus said to them, do you also wanna go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You've got the words of eternal life. And we also have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter almost says, we have no choice. <laughs> You're stuck with us, Jesus. Everybody else walked away. By all human measurements, Jesus was failing and as fully divine and fully human, I've gotta believe he experienced all of the emotions of failure. Even though he wasn't actually failing, we know that, he was accomplishing his mission perfectly, but by all human measurements and as a human being who had walk away, who had this you know, conspiracy from the religious people attacking him, constantly attacking him, you know he felt what we feel. He felt maybe a little humiliation. He felt maybe a little bit less than he did when he had thousands following him. He's fully human, fully divine, but fully human. And so I think Jesus knows what it feels like. Even though he didn't fail, he knows what that feels like. And if you know what failure or regret feels like, I wanna give you a couple of little bits to hang on to today. First, you are not alone. You're not alone. There's this little cliche out there that has been misused. Nobody's perfect, right? People who fail go to that real quick. <laughs> you know, well, nobody's perfect, meaning, I get, you know, chill. What I did wasn't so bad. Everybody does bad things. I would suggest not using that phrase in that context, right? We'll talk about that here in, in, in one minute. But it is true that nobody's perfect. And so if you're feeling a little bit of a unique shame or guilt around a failure of yours or a mistake or misstep, or regrets, just know you're not alone and there's some comfort. Don't ever use that as an excuse for doing something wrong. Um, but let that be of comfort, right? Everybody has failures, everybody has regrets. So that shame can kind of heal. Second, you may bear some consequences of a failure. Failures have consequences, but you won't bear the judgment of God. That is the good news, that is the gospel. God will not judge you. There might be consequences for doing something wrong, but God will not judge you. And, and that's something that's you know, wonderful to know. There's a difference between consequences and judgment. Consequences are the natural things that happen in the face of failure. I'll give you kind of a, a little bit of a gross but not graphic example. Uh, I was framing our first house. This is a very long time ago and I had a framing gun. Framing guns are that big, pneumatic guns that shoot three inch nails into wood. And uh, I've used nail guns since I was 17 years old. And so I was just, you know, busting out this house, doing blocking, block, ba -ba -ba, block, ba -ba. you know where this is going. I have a scar here and a scar here. <laughs> and it is not a divine sign. Uh, it, is, it is a very human mistake. Boom, ba -ba -ba -ba, boom, ba -ba -ba -ba, boom, bam. And I nailed my hand to a wall with a nail gun. I was by myself. I will spare you the details of how I got off that wall. It was not my happiest moment. Let's just put it that way. Let's just assume God forgave me for that mistake. God forgave me for that mistake. But there's still consequences. Right? And I still have the scars of that. So if we make a mistake, there could be painful consequences and there still might be scars, but in God's eyes, we're forgiven. In God's eyes, we're perfect. In God's eyes, there's nothing but love. As we sang earlier, he's proud of us. Even in our journey through and of failure. He's always for us. He's rooting for us. He's empowering us. And yes, he's grieved by the mistakes we made. And yes, he's grieved by the consequences of those mistakes. God isn't in the business of kind of removing the consequences of those mistakes. We've got some lessons to learn sometimes. But in his eyes, we are perfect. The way any decent parent in the face of their child's mistake would say, yep, you've got some consequences, dude. But um, I love you and I embrace you and I forgive you and let's walk a journey towards a second chance or third chance if you need it, right? 
This is who God is to us. So you may bear some consequences of a failure, but you won't bear the judgment of God. And you know, we're a, a Jesus-centered, grace-based church. We say that all the time, Jesus-centered, grace-based. And I cannot even tell you the amount of people who ask me the same question. Hey, you know, Treadway, you're so grace-based over there, and God forgives us always for everything, right? So that means we can just do whatever we want to, and there are no consequences. Like, okay, I'm gonna use my words very carefully here. That is a, I'll use the word silly. That's a silly question. I don't wanna use the word silly. That's a silly question. It would almost be as though, oh yeah, well, God forgives us of our sin time and time and time again, which is totally true. So I'm gonna keep nailing body parts to walls, right? Why would you do that? Mistakes have consequences. We, we don't do bad things because there are, are consequences. It's not that we don't do bad things because we fear the wrath of God. There is no wrath of God toward us. We're forgiven, totally forgiven. But we're not gonna keep ruining our lives and causing pain to ourselves or others. The Apostle Paul answers this in Romans 6. The Apostle Paul is saying in Romans 5, God's grace just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. And so there's that question then, well, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Why would I keep nailing body parts to the wall even though I'm forgiven, right? It's just... It doesn't make sense. So yes, we can do two things at the same time. Understand that we are always forgiven, no matter what, at the thousandth mistake we've made, the thousandth failure, there will always be forgiveness. But why would we keep doing that to ourselves and others? And the answer is we just shouldn't, right? Third, find an accepting, supportive community where you can be honest and bear one another's burdens. If you are feeling the feelings that come with failure, and regrets. Could it be shame? You know, could it be isolation? You just kind of think you're on your own. Find a community that you can trust and be honest with. And that is a great gift. If you've got some friends or a church community where you can say, you know what, I have made mistakes. I'm not gonna pretend I'm perfect. I'm not gonna pretend I have it all together. I've made mistakes. I've made failures in my life. And other people can say, well, I have failed too. And I'm gonna pour life into you and I'm gonna assure you of your forgiveness and grace and second and third and fourth chances. Find that community. It could be a church community, a small group. It could be Celebrate Recovery. There's so many opportunities for you to be real in the face of your failures. And then know that God is a loving father who forgives and gives you another chance always. Never think it's over. Never think it's over. You always have another chance. Always, always. So, so no matter the depth of your failure, no matter how, I guess, you know, repeated those failures are, get that vision in your life. The light will come again. And I'm gonna trust God. I'm gonna believe for that grace and for his strength. And I'm gonna start living my life as though I have another chance because I always do. So to get real practical, believe you're good with God. Just believe it. Now, belief is considering something true when you don't feel like it is. That's basically what belief is. You may not feel as though you're good with God because of your failures, because you've made mistakes, because you might keep making the same mistakes over and over, because you're not as good as you think you should be by now, right? These things can, can make us feel as though we're separated from God or that God is disappointed with us. He is not. So just change what you believe. Kind of force this belief that I am good with God. I am good with God. I'll give you a super practical example that I had to deal with when I was young. When I was young, I would, I would start to pray and I'd think to myself and feel, why am I praying? Because God just is disappointed with me. Why would I pray? All, I, all that I felt was this distance between a holy God and my failures. I felt that distance. And so very often I wouldn't even bother praying. I was disappointing God. I had to push faith into that to say, I believe I'm forgiven. I believe God always gives another chance. I believe that God is a father who, yes, doesn't like it when you know, I hurt myself or others, but loves me and is proud of me and always forgives. Believe you're good with God. Try to get in the habit of saying, I'm sorry. This is difficult for some people to say I'm sorry. For some people, I think it's like genetically impossible <laughs> for them to say I'm sorry. There's just some people that, why can't you just say those words? Well, this person, this person, this, just get in the habit. 
of saying I'm sorry. Um, back in my uh, younger days, and I mean younger adult days, not younger adult days, I, there was a lot of pride that prevented me from saying I'm sorry. And I had to practice saying I'm sorry. I had to practice saying my bad, I'm sorry, I'll do better. I had to practice that. And so I hope now it's becoming more you know, common. Just if I make a mistake, I am just so sorry. So much healing comes from a simple apology. Not, well, you did this and you did this and they did, you know. Humbly accept the consequences. There are consequences to failures. It's just the way life works. It's sort of the natural order that God created. There are consequences. Accept those consequences and realize that sometimes there's just some, you know, results that happen from failure. You don't have to like it, but it's just the way it is. Humbly accept it. Make amends when you can. Make amends when you can. Talk to a wonderful woman after last service and and she admitted she had failed a friend and that friend is kind of distant and so she's struggling to make amends. It's hard. Just keep it up. Keep it up. Make amends where you can. Try to make the wrong right. It's not just I'm sorry. I'm sorry is meaningful, but I'm gonna try to make this right now. And then rebuild good habits over time. Rebuild good habits over time. Those dark days can result over time in light. That shadow moves and light emerges. That's by God's grace and by God's strength. But it's also by us putting in the work of building better habits, good habits. You know, kind of taming our anger, taming our words, right? Just making better choices. Try to be a little more connected with God so the values of Jesus start to become your values a little more. Get the help you need if there's an addiction. Just these decisions, right? To, to build a better, brighter life. I love 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Get this, it's just this beautiful promise. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life, get this, has begun. There's a very specific Greek structure there. A new life has begun. In other words, brand new doesn't just happen like that, especially after a failure. Failure or regret, the light just doesn't emerge in an instant, right? The shadow just disappears over time. And light emerges over time. It's a journey. Sometimes it's complicated, but it's a journey. But never lose hope, even in the midst of your own failure or in the failures of others, that life will emerge. A new life has begun. I'm gonna close out in a, in a story here. We're gonna sing a song together. This church has been around for 54 years. There have been two pastors, two lead pastors in those 54 years. There's been a bunch of other pastors who have served this church very, very well over five and a half decades. Over that period of 54 years, there have been three pastors who have made very serious mistakes, failures. And when a pastor fa fails in a big way, it becomes, you know, unfortunately, a little bit public. And there's a lot there. A lot of trust is broken. A lot of emotions happen. Over 54 years, Rancho Church has had three pastors fail fairly publicly. One of those pastors, uh, very early on, this is like in the 70s, uh, just left, was caught and disappeared. Left the church, left his family, left the community, like gone. Um, that was a light that turned dark and there just wasn't light that emerged. He didn't handle that failure, you know, great. There's another pastor, and this was during early in my uh, tenure here, uh, failed, was caught, and immediately blamed everybody. I mean, blamed everybody, and blamed everything. Blamed the air he breathed and everybody around him. And, and there was an exit there that was not very fun. That darkness kind of stayed dark, and light didn't emerge. It just wasn't handled well by him. The third pastor, this was about 25 years ago, he has my lifelong admiration. He has my lifelong admiration. He did fail very publicly and it was very tough. I was not the lead pastor at the time, I was a young minister and I wanted his head on a platter. I'm just being honest with you. I was not gracious. I had not had my grace awakening. I felt personally betrayed by him and the pain that that caused his family and the church, I was furious. 
I considered him a friend and a partner and a colleague. And for him to fail like that, I mean, I was furious. And I just wanted him gone. The lead pastor at the time, fortunately, <laughs> was full of grace and said, hey, we're not gonna, the way he put it, we're not gonna shoot our wounded. And I thought to myself, well, he wounded himself. <laughs> so, well, we walked through this whole deal and he led the way. I'm here on the sidelines judging hard. He led the way towards grace. Some elders got involved and walked with this gentleman and his family for years. And it was the most beautiful story of restoration I have ever experienced. I experienced it on the sideline, judging from the sideline. Then I kind of got in the mix, became the lead pastor, had a good grace awakening, and he and his family, it was one of the first stories where the grace of God got a chance to work in a way that I was privileged to experience. And one of the first things I got to do as a new lead pastor, and it was on this very stage, lay hands on this gentleman and ordain him back into ministry. Full restoration. It took years, I think four years. Very deliberate, very loving, very grace based process of restoring his family and restoring trust. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever had the privilege of doing. And that is the story of God. Through failure and the darkness of failure, light can emerge. And so that's your story. If you've experienced failure and you're bearing the weight of failure, let that light emerge. God loves you, he's proud of you. There's nothing between you and him. As you deal with maybe the consequences, be surrounded by love and grace and not a judgmental you know, group, but a, a group that loves and embraces and accepts and walks with you toward healing ahead and light ahead. Uh, we're gonna close in a song that is just this simple declaration of this truth. It's called One Thing Remains. And so uh, Evan, our choices are all, all over the place. Sometimes we do great things, sometimes we fail. Um, the judgment of others is all over the place. The consequences of failure is all over the place. But one thing remains, and that is God's grace and love in our lives. That's right. And this song was actually written. This is a, um, a kind of a remake of this song. Uh, Israel yeah. got a hold of it, and uh, as he does. Did his thing. He does things. Uh, and so, uh, but at the original version of this song, this was written by somebody who was going through a massive failure and it was explained as there's a wall it was like a wall there's no way forward but the one thing that he could continue to focus on was god's love for him was never ending it was right there and it wasn't on the other side of the wall yeah. it was walking with him to help him get through uh this moment so, it's so the, the song the is like on that. god's love never fails and That's he right. never gives up on us so That's it's right. kind of a fun song as well there's a little reggae in the middle there <laughs> so let's all stand and uh, let's close out with this great declaration let's do it
absolutely fantastic way to end this, uh, this Sunday with the love of God that never fails. Yeah, you know, I love that you clarified that the consequences we experience are not the judgment of God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just really, really important uh, reminder. So thank you for that. Well, thank you very much. And over here, we have prayer. If you would love for somebody to pray with you today, share a burden with you today, we have a team of folks over here that would be honored to pray with you. Absolutely. And then if I haven't met you yet, if you're fairly new to Rancho, uh, myself, my wife, and my youngest would be over there. And we'd love to just say hi and get to know you a little bit. And uh, we also want you to sign up for this cornhole tournament tomorrow, or tomorrow, next Sunday. It's going to be absolutely epic. And uh, we're going to have fun and food and jumpies and volleyball and basketball. So, you know, plan on staying after. We've got a new Gaga pit out there as well. So that's just, you know. Three quarters of the room has no idea what that is. But come just to find out what it is. It's going to be awesome. Uh, We are so glad to be with you on Sunday. Have a great afternoon. Absolutely. Take care.